You want to get started? Yeah. Probably should. It's about five minutes after. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, I think I know most of you. Uh, if I don't, I'm Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the city councilor for Ward 3. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so please, please, hold your applause. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and welcome. Thank you for taking the time to, to come to this constituent meeting. Um, let's see. We'll, we'll be official and say that we'll be in audio and visual re visually recorded by Ruth McGrath of the North Street Association. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, People will drift in. I guess the format of this, in my mind, uh, is I'd like to give a, an update about what I've been working on for long three months that I've been the city council. Uh, and uh, then we can open it up to what I hope is more free flowing discussion about questions you might have, comments you might have uh, about what's happening in the city. And I know there's a lot of people today who want to talk about. Uh, North Street issues, um, but the topics are, are not confined by any means to North Street issues. <coughs> so, this is what's happening. The, the City Council has convened for a new term. Uh, committee assignments have been made. Um, I'm going to serve on the Ordinance Committee, on the Joint Schools and City Council Conference Committee. I'll be on the Housing and Land Use and Economic Development Committee. And also be chair of the uh, Transportation Parking Commission, which I think is important for Ward 3. Um, and that, that's actually a lot of stuff we'll be talking about today, but it's, it's traffic um, in the North Street area. Um, the major thing that we've done so far, I'm sure you've, you've read about, is tackle this stormwater ordinance. And I've asked that everyone leave your rotten vegetables and other projectiles <laughs> outside. Um, you practice your throwing arm, your throwing arm at a later time, but it's it's a little controversial. But we got that done. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it is a um, a new utility that is similar to water and sewer. Uh, the city has pursued in order to raise revenue to do a couple things. One, fix the levees along the Mill River and the Connecticut River and to upgrade stormwater infrastructure, the pipes and cash basins and outfalls that are across the city. And a lot of this is in response to the federal mandate that we have to comply with. And if we don't, uh, there's these draconian fines that come with it. Um, and the sad reality is that the state of Massachusetts, um, like many other things, has not funded uh, cities and towns and to the degree I, I believe they should uh, in terms of the basic infrastructure we need. And as a result, local governments turn uh, to things like increasing property tax and, and new fees like the stormwater utility in order to raise revenue. So it's, it's, it's a regressive model, but it's one that the city had to take action on to, to, to do these, to meet this challenge. Um, I, I'd like to brag about two things that they did which I think made the stormwater utility better. Uh, the first was an amendment to mandate transparency for this new enterprise fund. Uh, I think it's important that if we're going to have this enterprise fund, everybody should be fully aware of how every dollar is spent from it and what it, they were spent on. Uh, so the Board of Public Works is going to make a, an annual report to the City Council and public and put a written report online that makes that information transparent and public. Um, secondly, I offered an amendment, and, and this passed like the other one, uh, to make the, make the curve of the fee structure a little bit more progressive. <coughs> Uh, so that smaller properties um, got a little bit more of a break and that people weren't paying uh, for impervious surface that they don't actually have. Because you, as you know, this fee is based on the amount of impervious surface like driveways and roofs that you have in your property. So I'm hoping that that amendment made it a little bit more fair and a little bit more powerful. So I'm actually proud of that. I'm proud of that. Um, the final thing I'll mention before we open up to, to general conversation, and again, it's been a whopping three months that I've been in City Council. Um, I've been a strong advocate for a Community Preservation Act grant uh, to renovate uh, the playground at Bridge Street School. And I've worked with um, parents and faculty at Bridge Street School who have, I don't want to misrepresent it, they've done the, uh, the, the lion's share of the work. They've done an amazing job in making this application to the CPA. It's basically to repair the actual ground where the, where the kids play, which as you know is basically just a, a, a looks like you know, a desert, essentially. It's dusty and muddy. 
and the proposal is to make very modest um, improvements to the playground so um, kids have a nice place to play. At the same time, the city council approved going after <coughs> a uh, state grant, which is um, also for playgrounds, but one we're going to pursue for Lampern Park, which is right, of course, adjacent to Bridge Street. So hopefully those two things can work in tandem and we can have some money and some, some willpower to kind of improve that corner um, for recreation, for use for the students and for members of the community. Um, so I think that that's, that's, a very good, um, that's a very good development. And, you know, again, it's been three months. So those are the three things I'd like to highlight. Um, I think it's more important that we open it up to questions from, from everyone here. Like I said, I know there's a lot of questions about North Street in particular. Um, and, you know, David Newton? Where's David? Where are you going? I might, I might call on you first to, to lead off, but if you... Um, yeah, why don't I actually? Because I, I, I've been talking with David about setting this meeting up, and he, was, um, he took the lead in, in helping get people together for today, so I'd like to ask you, unless there's any general questions for me to start, but well, why, don't, why don't we go with David? Just very briefly, and I'll sit, sit back down again. I just kind of threw this together an hour ago to try to get kind of a guideline to what I assume might be some of the most frequently asked questions and, uh, and issues that are of, of concern to everybody. Um, I think there's kind of a, as you look through the list, there's kind of a dynamic between, uh, as I wrote it out, between the, the improvements on the road the temptation to drive fast when you can, and the dynamic between the drivers, uh, the times of day, the new crosswalks, um, the parking um, in areas where there, there is some parking. And it's kind of a, it, I think what, what we all need to kind of just share with each other is how we might be able to improve on what I, what I think of as kind of a <clears throat> a potential safety issue for the overall street in terms of pedestrians and drivers. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of other attending pieces of that, but to my mind, it's kind of the, the we, had, we had, for instance, a couple of accidents almost back to back uh, with admittedly bad driving conditions, but it was interesting to kind of see in, in the case of one accident, was, which was out in front of our building, how it all kind of evolved. There was a slip, slippery surface. Uh, there were cars parked on the street close to our parking lot. And the, and the two cars that eventually collided were converging on that spot. And the combination of, it was kind of a perfect storm of, of limited limited width in the road because of the parked cars and two cars coming towards one another in slippery conditions and it, it was just it, it tended to be kind of a perfect storm at that spot and I'm sure potentially that has problems Joan has mentioned uh, Joan Rizul has mentioned on her curve what I've referred to as the DA Sullivan curve there, there happens to be no parking signs on the outside of the curve um, and possibly DPW can address that as part of, part of a few questions that I'm sure you may have for them. But I, I would just open it up and kind of go one, go down the list, and it might be a good idea, whatever you think, is to maybe have, use this as a guideline, but if you want to talk in and around this of other things that concern you that are not on the list, um, we can do that. I'm not well, let's sure. do, let's yeah. do. First, um, I forgot to recognize uh, we're fortunate to have Ned Huntley and David Valletta from the Department uh, of Works. And um, I would like to take a look at, if you look at this list of questions, the first thing on there is um, enthusiastic thank you. Uh, it goes out to the engineering staff who did all the work on North Street. And uh, yeah, we <laughs> Much, much, much better, <laughs> which is faint praise. <laughs> but, um, but you, you deserve uh, really, really high praise for all the work you've done. We appreciate you coming here today. Um, and that's the spirit in which we're going to have this, this conversation. Although there are specific issues to address and, and, and talk about. Um, 
But my recommendation is we just take them one by one, issue by issue. Um, so I guess I guess I just open it up. Does, does anyone want to call something out in terms of something you want to ask about? But I guess the one of the, I, I live at the, my name's Sam. I, I live at the, the corner <coughs> of North and Day slash Industrial Drive, whatever you want to call that. And to me, and I don't know how to resolve this, but the, the stop sign rival does not exist on that curve. Mm -hmm. and, I, and honestly, I mean, maybe I'm just more sensitive because I live there, mm -hmm. but I think that a lot of the speed problems for the whole street start there. And I think if somehow, and I don't even know how to go about stop, you know, getting people to slow down, but, but if, if that was, if it was just slowed there, then at, at, at North Street, and not, not Day Avenue, but the North Street stop sign. What it is is people turn people from uh, uh, is that Damon Road down there? Bay, uh, Bay Street coming down from no, Industrial Park. Yeah, but from, coming from Industrial Park, they they, they cross they, they use it as a cross to get onto 91, right. and so they just cruise down and then they they, they just sort of flip around that corner real fast. <laughs> they, they go still down, and uh, uh, you know, outside of just the big guy yelling at them, which does work. But I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you use you elsewhere in the city, right? Away. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it seems like that's just sort of where it starts, and uh -huh. it clearly allows. You know, I, I, don't, I don't even. I mean, there is a stop sign there, so I'm not sure what you, what else you did. I, I, I'll, add, I'll add a little piece to that, is that from the other direction, as you're coming around the D.A. Sullivan curve, when you're coming out of the constriction of the center city portion of North Street, and you come around that curve, that's a spot where an awful lot of drivers also have a temptation to begin to speed up because it's, it's going on to the straight out of that curve, and they're speeding coming down in the opposite direction from that spot. And that's what my recommendation was for maybe revisiting the idea of originally discussed bump in the area of Highland so that as they're coming out of the constriction of the under railroad underpass, they hit the first they hit the first bump and that keeps them from accelerating around the corner and speeding down the street. There have been occasions when um, the folks who live on the right side of the street as you're going up north um, back out, and you can't see them until you come around the corner. Very so very dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. That's up. <laughs> 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 trying to, trying to see you. somebody coming around the corner as you're backing out right. is almost impossible. They yeah. absolutely, they just fly around that curve, and, and you just you turn your head, and you look left, and there's no one coming. You look right, there's no one coming, and you turn again, and, and someone is gone. They've already gone by you. Did you say it's like they were so fast? We are right on the curve on North Street. Yeah. Diagonally yeah. right. across from DA's hall. Because there's no good line of sight. You can't see far yeah. down yeah. either way. <coughs> would, would a mirror help them? I mean, I don't, I'm just yeah. sort of designing. I mean, maybe the engineers could. Yeah, what precedents are there for the mirrors? Yeah. yeah. I mean, say, are they all, do they have any public mirrors? Are they all private yeah. and stuff? They're all private. Where's the speed bumps over there? I was just <laughs> you know, that was kind of the, the, some, the thinking was if we could somehow encourage drivers to not go around that corner so fast by having the first speed bump going into North Street prior to that corner, they, they might not go around that corner quite so fast because there's a tendency to kind of get to that corner, they know they go around it, and then they have kind of a straight run to Parsons and straight on past the cemetery. <coughs> Uh, I will say. No. <coughs> I was just going to add, and and so far the speed bumps we've called them speed waves because they're just <coughs> very gentle rises, and I don't know um, what it would take to make them significant speed bumps so that people would slow down. There's no reason or necessity to slow down for that speed bump. Yeah. That's the ones that we have. You can right. just sail along. The technical term is speed hump. Speed hump. Yeah. That's yeah. what we have on our street. Yeah. Yeah. But but the ramp on either side of them is so gradual, that means the cars don't 
They don't matter. If there's no actual bump, it's just a rise in the road and it drops back down again. With a stripe on the right. Why did you have? Yeah, the only thing I was talking to uh, Felix Harvey, who um, was the, most of the time, the guy on the street that <coughs> got um, overseeing a uh, uh, the words. I'm not really sure exactly what he did, but um, I was harassing him about the, you know, those crosswalks. And he said, well, they're not really speed bumps. They're uh, elevated crossways for people. So I think many of us come into this going, well, how come the stupid thing isn't taller? Like the ones on Holly, as you keep going farther down. And it's just that that's not what they were built for. So, so this is, there. I think there was a misunderstanding about what those things were going to be and what they were going to do to the traffic flow. Right, so is that, is that kind of an accurate way of describing it, that <coughs> speed bumps are never intended to be these monstrous things that shut down cars as they, as they go over them. It's just they were there to highlight the fact that there's a crosswalk. Well, but it is slow, slow vehicles down, too. Mm -hmm. It doesn't slow people down. Mm -hmm. As several people have said to me, you go over it the first time, and after you slow down and realize, oh, this is nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. And then so they speed. ignore it. I mean, it's, it's so subtle that people have fun going over it at 50. You know, they, they, they get almost it's a sporty event for them. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's, it's not the, the speed bump. We're, we're talking about a street that has no speed bumps, but I think we have crosswalks. And then the question is, are, are speed bumps something we should not consider and consider something else? Or, or you know, that's just an open discussion. Uh, well, I, I sort of have several comments which are really observations. Um, I'm not <coughs> sure you can really actually fix any of the things. Uh, a little consolation prize for you, Lisa and I, my neighbor, I'm at the Dennis Helmus 176 North Street. There only used to be a two-way stop there. And it took me with counselor, uh, uh, four counselors ago, two years to put the additional stop sign in there to make it a free stop in front of numerous committees and Chief Sinkowitz and others at the time had said you cannot use stop signs as traffic calming measures. Now I read in the paper, this is a fine example of traffic calming. I spent two years uh, <laughs> fighting uh, the, the non-traffic calming thing. So that's just an aside. Thank you guys. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really love and fought that battle for you. But, um, I, and I also want to say it's, it's a great road, it's a great curve. The company who hired it did a great job. And I like being right most of the time, but some of the fears that I had about what would happen by not listening to some of the neighbor's comments in terms of not wanting two sidewalks, wanting a bicycle lane, cutting off 4J and Susan's funeral home, the overflow parking next to the uh, cemetery, um, for my observation, seems to be true. And so I would say, first of all, that from the speed points of view, because the road is so good, you know, and I travel that road all the time, I walk most of the time on the weekends, is people do ignore this big crosswalks because it's not really a bump or a hump. You know, I don't know if the DPW is able to fix that to slow things down, if they consider that to be an acceptable traffic calming technique, which did not used to be the case 15 years ago when I got the stop sign in but it is on Holly Street. The problem with not having the bike lane, uh, myself and others participated with Smith College when they had this, when Mr. Huntley had the me numerous meetings in this room um, that said they would consider not having the two sides. Well, okay, that, that's water under the dam. It is what it is. Nothing's gonna get dug up. But I'm not sure how to solve that. So as our neighborhood changes, and with more young people and more uh, children, and getting to the bike path in the summertime, the road is so narrow from essentially Mr. Archambault's house up past uh, Lincoln that when there's kids or parents riding on the street, I'm worried about having somebody hit. I think someday someone will be hit, someone will be killed on that street because there is no bike lane. They don't ride on the sidewalks. I don't know uh, if you can, you know, if there's a no riding bikes on sidewalks. I don't know if we can dedicate one of the sidewalks on, on the, on the, on the uh, cemetery side for bicycles, because as more children and adults try to get to the bike path, they just ride around. It's a real safety issue in that regard. 
The other thing is, um, I, I believe because they may have the NID industry currently could maybe speak to that. They narrowed the road. I think it's another traffic calming thing. Some people have come, well, because you can still park, people are going to have to slow down in order to, because they're not going to be able to cross in the street unless they hit each other, because who's going to give? Who's going to be on the light of what way? Because some people don't follow traffic rules. Well, okay, if there's a car park here, traffic in the opposite direction has the right of way, and then people have to go around, but people don't follow those kinds of things anymore, actually. So, interestingly enough, and perhaps Jay can speak to this when I, uh, last month, it's also been an unusual winter year, so there was a lot of snow, the road got even narrower. Right. I came <coughs> home to work, this was last month, I don't know if it was the police chief of Hadley's funeral or the other popular person. Yeah, uh, two back-to-back -to -back popular people. And I went out to shovel, <coughs> and the traffic was backed up because there was no, uh, your parking lot was filled up. I actually let, what's his name, park in my driveway because he couldn't get to work because there was no overflow parking. The traffic was parked up, all backed up all the way past Mr. Archambault's house and all the way to Lincoln. It was deadlocked because people were parked in front of the funeral home trying to get in, go down Elizabeth. And I just stood there and actually started laughing because nobody could go anywhere. And then people started blowing their horns, then people were getting out of their Yeah, at the funeral. Then people are getting out of their cars going, you know, what the expletive is going on? <laughs> and then the other guy in front of me is going, I don't know what's going on. I, nobody seems to be moving. Do you know what's going on? And then finally people, they're starting, as they have all-wheel drive, they're going up on, this, on the snow drift trying to, uh, you know, where I am standing, thinking, oh, now they're going to slide back down in their Subaru. <laughs> well, enough of that, you get the picture. So I don't, I, I mean, I, you, you, I went to Jay and it was like, well, what we were worried about certainly happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't know how to solve that. It, you know, I don't know what you're going to do about that. Um, so those are the main things that I, I think you have on here mm -hmm. is, is children and parents' bicycle safety issues the narrowness in, in parking, um, and people just not using common courtesy, you know, and, and not stopping. And I don't know how we're going to get people to stop. You know, the police occasionally put up a speed limit. Your speed limit is going 30. Uh, you know, you're going 40. Speed limit is 30. Just when they're going over the crosswalk rise. Woo wee, go faster. I want my stomach to drop out. You know, that, I don't know how you're going to solve those. So, so there are issues. Well, one piece that i just add to that for a minute that I think we should all think about as an over, overarching uh, phenomenon that we've kind of come to notice as a change since the improvement is that the street is now a city thoroughfare. It's not a side, you know, we were kind of a slash side street, a little lazier before the improvement. The improvement's been done. It's living up to its name as a city center thoroughfare from the, from the highway to the center of the city and back again. So we are, in a sense, closer to the Con Street definition of access to the city and exit from the city than we were before the improvement. And I think part of a lot of these issues that are coming up that have been there before are exacerbated now by the fact that the impression of the drivers especially non-local drivers who just come and go in and out of the city and use it as a thoroughfare, just, they, just the way they would con street, is that it's, the perception is that it's a, a wide open access road into the city and people are always in a hurry. I have one feedback thing that reminds me, I'm sorry. Um, where the road is narrower, you cannot get out of your driveway the way you used to and stay on your side of the road. So, for example, Diane and, Le Diane and Lisa Maloney, who are my next door neighbors, literally cannot, I cannot <coughs> get out of my driveway, but I have, a, I have a dirt driveway, which I presume will not be taxed for impervious, impervious purposes. But in any event, I have people who, uh, they blow their horns at us as we want to get out of our driveway because they're going so fast, it's like, well, this is our street. It's just yeah. another aside. Yeah. I, I, I live on Dan. Oh, you live on so Dan. Okay. <coughs> a lot of that traffic either comes in our street through Dan Avenue or goes down, or comes from yeah, okay, the actual so drive. So I have the same problem. Yeah. Yeah. 
just out of curiosity, um, is this parking on North Street prior to the repavement? There used to be signs on, I believe, both sides of the street saying no parking. I'm not even positive about that. But now I'm not sure what the parking situation is on North. What's up, Lincoln? It was, it had been um, above Lincoln towards the Cove place. It was parking both sides. Um, but once you got down past Lincoln, it became one sided. And I know there wasn't any parking in front. I live right at the intersection of Lincoln and North. And there wasn't parking right in front of our house, and there wasn't parking to the to the right of us down towards town. But I don't really know what the pattern was. There were people, I'm not sure the people who were, who were parking in the overflow um, from the funeral home, whether they were really parking. There's know. always been parking from the cemetery down to almost your house. Right. On, on my side, so there's always been parking there. The by the cemetery, it's just it became people parked on the grass. Right. Um, there's always uh, always been parking there, never on the on the other side. And again, as when we're going through this, we we knew they're going to you know look at narrowing the streets. These were the issues that nobody seemed to care about too much at that time, and now you're suffering. It's like again, they wanted people to park on both sides or on one side at least you know to slow down traffic calming so everybody that wanted traffic calming didn't realize well you get other headaches with this um we've uh i know for you know the funerals that you're talking about chief Hockowitz, we had at any given time probably <laughs> 15 police officers and cruisers trying to direct traffic and half the time they just help screw it up more. Um, so then I think they thought they weren't really doing much so they didn't come out to the next funeral that we said was going to be huge. And that's when more of the issues came out um, and we called the police department and they just said they were too busy um, and it's not a busy night. So they didn't come out to help. Um, and that's strictly because again the, <coughs> the road was always built to have parking on the side and you could have two cars go by. Now on their own street, which is, so now we're done, that'll never be able to happen again. <coughs> um, and again, with, I know with, it's, it's a pain in the butt for everybody, it's a pain in the butt for me because again, for everybody that's coming there, it used to be much easier to park and get around and safer. Um, but. It, it, it's, it's, it is what it is right now. The biggest thing uh, we're trying to deal with is, you know, when we know there's going to be a big funeral, if the police will help with doing some of that. Uh, I've talked to a lot of police officers privately, and again, it's kind of like, when you don't have intelligent drivers, or even a police officer can't do a lot. Um, and uh, as for the speeding, pretty much, the, the most effective, and I think you know, we've, uh, as a funeral home and family, we've been there since 1950, and over time it's been paved and nicer, and we paved road, everyone wants to speed on. That's just natural. Um, we used to have the police department park in our parking lot a lot, um, and giving out tickets, and trust me, that is the one and only true, especially at night, um, turn when people know, ooh, we start getting a couple of tickets because there's always police on North Street, people will slow down. Is that um, the same amount or something you're saying happens less now? But you know, well, it, I think everybody's kind of, you know, I hate to say, I think we're all jumping the gun in this. It, it, the street just got fixed. Um, so we haven't even had a year worth of anything. Um, ideas, data, but I know in the past one's been paved. That'd be one of those things. The police were there, you know, two or three times a week, you know, over the time when it, just because they know. I mean, it's common sense. You pay any road in the city, people are going to speed down it. Um, we did it on Prospect Avenue. Um, they had the police there more often. Uh, and I think that's one of our biggest things if we could, you know, have speed traps. If you have the police department, you know, kind of knowing the public gets to know real quick that if you go down the streets speeding, you're going to get tickets. Um, like I said, putting out the, you're going 30, that's just a joke. And 
everybody knows it's like that guy. There's no police if you see that sign, so go ahead and speak. <laughs> it's kind of like a fastball pitcher, you know, trying to you know get a radar gun. Uh, to me, those things never seem to work. But um, if we could actually have some, you know, the police officers, you know, doing some speed traps, I think that would really affect um, what's going on. And that, and one of the comments in, in the listing is the time of day, which is really important. I think I, I think most of you will agree that. The, the speeding issues are in direct relation, or the, 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 the amount of speeding is in direct proportion to the lightness of the traffic on the street. In the business, the busy business hours, there's a kind of self-controlling element to the traffic movement, but as soon as the traffic thins out at the end of the business day and late into the evening, and <coughs> especially weekends, and especially weekend evenings, Saturday, i.e. Friday and Saturday nights is when people go really fast on the, on the road. So my recommendation would be is to kind of have the speed traps at, at those hours, primarily because that's when the traffic seems to be uh, tempting, tempted to go faster during that period. Which interesting irony is that the, the park cars wish to slow people down and there are more park cars during the business hours and less park cars after business hours and on weekends, so it really opens up on those downtimes, on the after hour periods, which I think is the biggest challenge from a safety and speed standpoint. Um, there are two things I'm wondering about. What are the issues in speed humps and speed dips with snow plowing? Um, because that's a whole other issue and sometimes um, I don't know whether a speed hump is smaller because it's snow plow issues or um, something else, and also with speed dips um, as opposed to speed humps. Um, uh, so what's that with snow in the winter? And the other is signage. There is no, I walk along North Street a lot. <coughs> I ha I'm Sydney, I live um, uh, in the other uh, area of difficulty, which is right near I-91 um, entrance, so that's been our um, our little um, gift. Uh, but I'll walk back up to Crosby and then over to North Street and then down into town on North. So I'm walking quite a bit through there, and I my memory's not so great. I'm not a great witness, but I don't remember signage happening. So I don't know that there's signage saying you're entering a residential area with a different speed limit. I don't know that from the industrial park to wherever. And, um, or anything saying that it's residential versus um, uh, industrial. And um, I also have not ever seen, and to the people who live on the corner of where Sullivan's, um, the D.A. Sullivan is. I apologize. I've walked by all there. I have never thought about backing up into traffic with a hidden driveway. I've not ever seen a, a sign that says hidden driveway. Um, so, and I've lived in Northampton for a zillion years. Um, so it never even dawned on me, even though I walk by all the time. Um, is there some signage? Um, and the other thing which Dennis, uh, I mean, is there a possibility of another stop sign on North Street? somewhere else, so that you just simply have to stop. Um, I think, I mean, my idea would be Lincoln, um, but I think that's too close maybe at Elizabeth or something because now it's traffic calming. Could you put a stop sign up and just stop the traffic? Um, so anyway, those so were the, but I would be interested in what um, Ned has to say yeah. about the um, snow plowing and speed pumps. Right, this is where we defer to the experts. Um, I guess we'll, we can take snow plowing. Uh, sure. <coughs> so I was invited to come to Ryan tonight to listen. I really didn't realize I was going to come to speak to issues at hand. Oh, well, that's, that's um, fair enough. That's fine. Yeah. But as far as speed dips, we wouldn't put dips in the road because they would collect water. Unless they were a drainage job. So the speed tables or speed pumps or speed these crosswalks do work. I think we probably could get a little more deflection on North Street to create a, a, a little more oomph to it. And it is, right? I got a med riding over it. It's not quite what I expected either. You can be changing that. Yeah. Answer. So, looking at that, as far as additional signage, we just don't put up stop signs to stop cars. <coughs> we put 
put a stop sign because there's a reason, there's a safety issue. Uh, you usually have to meet some form of warrants with the manual and uniform traffic control devices. Uh, I was the one who actually put the stop sign or wrote the ordinance for the stop sign at the end of the day in North and Main Street back in 2000, 2001 when we were in Moscow. That's where we went to. So, um, as far as, like I said, the speed bumps, I mean, we can look at trying to address those and get a little more vert vertical deflection out of that um, as, as a fix on that. As far as trying to deal with a lot of other things that were brought up about a bike lane, uh, we started from the day one that there really wasn't enough features or room in the layout of North Street to do it with it. If you want a standard bike lane next to parked cars, it's six feet in width. If you want it without parked cars, it's five feet in width. If you start putting it on both lanes, then you have no side I mean, it was a trade-off in what to do with this neighborhood without substantial land taking. So, right. And obviously, and I believe that you can ride bicycles on the North Street sidewalks or outside the downtown business area. So that's okay. That's well, yeah. that's driven by ordinance. You have yeah. to read the ordinance to see which street specifically you can't skateboard or ride a bicycle on. I think it's just the downtown business area. Yeah. And, you know, to, I think at the base of your point is, is what other people have mentioned, that we are, we are where we are today, and we're not digging up the street again. So I guess this is, and yeah, I, I think everyone knows that, no one's suggesting it, it's saying otherwise, but yeah, the challenge is how do we make modest improvements, if, if there are any to make, with what we have right now. So, I, I was, thank you. you know, yes. talking about the, uh, the width requirements for a uh, uh, bike path, and I was just wondering what the width requirement was for a particular street that has parking on it. Because, you know, when the cars are parked there, uh, the cars take up probably 80% of the lane. And therefore, the cars that have to go around that have to, first of all, cross the double the yellow line, which is illegal, in order to get around that. I came across a parked car on North Street with a bicycle going by. He could barely get around the parked car itself. Uh, and I understand that it's traffic calming, but to, to me, uh, with the line of sight that these cars park there, <coughs> that it's actually more of a traffic hazard. And so, you know, I was doing a little bit of reading in some other cities, and they have minimum widths for a street, which allows parking on it. And I was wondering if we had that here. I don't know the answer to that. I can, I can try and find out. Okay. Minimum width. Yeah, because the street yes. at which <coughs> parking is, is allowed. So Correct. You want to, okay. I don't know, but I can. I can. One other picadillo that nobody sort of raised is the, the semi trucks that still go up uh, the road. That's a big so issue we haven't brought up yet. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> I'll be quiet. Let you bring it up. I, I mean, Owen was working I've been on. I've been coming. Yeah. <laughs> Owen was working on getting them to change the GPS, the, the address for Coca Cola, so their GPS is would actually <coughs> route them around. I, I didn't know if you followed up the know or you know I actually contacted NASTEC um, today, which I understand there's an officer, Michael Allen, at the police department who had tried contacting them, I believe, in 2009. And I believe they do GPS for cars, trucks. I think they do not just residential, but commercial, all kinds of um, GPS and correct me if I'm wrong if anybody knows differently, but they had like an online email form that the officer completed just to let them know that there was an issue that the tractor trailers were being routed erroneously to the Coca-Cola plant. And there was never any real response. The company said that they were going to send out reps <coughs> to kind of get locations for the GPS. Uh, they never did. But they never did. I called today and I got this woman, <laughs> I was trying to ask her if there was someone at the company that I could actually speak to. <laughs> and um, the answer was a very firm no. And I got an email address um, that I haven't sent an email to them yet, but I was going to speak with you, Ryan, and see who might want to be CC'd on that to try to get as many you know, people behind it as possible that when you need contact, it made an impact. No, that's good. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, please feel free to drop me on that. Okay. Or I can initiate it. Okay, yeah. Sure. 
Yeah. Um, I, I know when the last one you said that Owen was really trying to work yeah. on talking and, uh, you know, uh, the mayor and everything with Cope trying to get them involved. And last he told me, it's Cope was trying to tell their delivery people, um, but they were getting a lot of the truckers and even once you get one of the GPS people to put the new input, um, but if the truckers would need to then update mm -hmm. uh, yeah. their their maps. So the the company itself might have the new route designed, but the truckers themselves, if they're not paying for a new device or a new update and get that software, they don't have it. They're still going back, and that was the problem he said he was really having. A lot of the companies were willing to do the update, but the actual truckers themselves weren't, yeah. you know, getting the new equipment or the new update onto their machines and in their trucks. Yeah, just a quick comment then, and what, um, my understanding is, I mean, there's, there's multiple parts to this problem. One is people who don't <coughs> actually know where they're going, and they, they can be used by a GPS. Another is people who do know where they're going, um, and then even despite what the GPS says, they, they know the shortcut and they'll go anyway. And then there are people who are legitimately make a legitimate mistake coming off the highway, and there needs to be some solution. But yeah, I mean the GPS is, is one of those three legs of this problem for sure. Well, I was just gonna say I know that there's a there's signage up on the uh, on the exit ramp. Um, it doesn't seem very prominent, and it's almost like it, you know if I have if I'm driving a big truck and I got a light that I want to go through, and here's this sign that starts to flash at me, and I already know that um, I'm not going to be able to shift over into the left lane and make a turn at the speed that I'm probably traveling at. You know, it doesn't make much sense. It needs to be farther up to give them the think time to react and say, okay, I've got to be in the right-hand lane, not the left-hand lane. I also feel that some of those people aren't really lost. You know, they got a GPS that's routing them the shortest route possible. I think it's shorter mm -hmm. to go from that intersection to the Coke plant down Lincoln and up north. I, I don't know whether that's true or not. That's, that's why the GPS tells them that. Right, so, it so it's not it's really an error anywhere, and I don't see how a GPS is going to, s when you put, at least the way that it works for me, I understand you put an address in and ask it for the shortest distance, it doesn't care where you are. It's and, and it doesn't care what you're driving. Right. <laughs> right. And that's a problem because these truckers are buying hundred dollar car GPSs to get them around rather than the uh, rather than subscribing to the tractor trailer uh, the units driving. that would tell them when they can or oh, can't actually, go somewhere. I'm sorry, Wendy was first. Okay. One thing that seems easily done and would help enormously is the two Coca Cola signs in the area were not the size of postage stamps. Yeah. I mean, you have to be under them with binoculars to see that this is what you do. You go straight off exit 19 mm -hmm. into the industrial park. You don't see them until you've already made that left turn. What was that little red thing? Mm -hmm. They're tiny. Mm -hmm. You cannot see them. They're invisible. If we could implore a change in that, it would be a really fast and good way to start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think what somebody said about the when you're getting off exit 19, the truckers are committed to the left lane because that's where their GPS might be directing them to, and it doesn't matter if they're getting a flashing light. They don't have the option to get over into this yeah. line to go straight. They got it. They're, you're there. Even if you're in a car, you can't make that move, you know, to get to go straight if you're already in the left lane. And I don't so think that the GPS is going to tell you that your route is okay, but there's a problem downtown, right? Yeah. right? And if they do see that the problem is downtown, they know they're not going there. Why should they bother? They just go around the corner and up north. And another right. issue, if a driver has been here before, and he does go down, or she does go down Damon Road to make a left on the industrial drive, that left is hellish. Right. And you would be like, forget it. I'm going down Lincoln mm -hmm. Ave, and mm -hmm. I'm going to route through there. That's right. The because yeah. that left, if you're either yeah. coming off of industrial drive or getting onto it, is yeah. Night, yeah. Well, that's something to, to report to you. So, I mean, in the works, my understanding is that as part of the upgrades for the train and that crossing, that there perhaps will be some an effort to put a light there. 
We expect the signal to be installed next year. Okay. Is the signal going to be? Did everyone, did everyone hear that? Yeah. That's, that's kind of something. That there's the expectation of a light being installed at Industrial Drive next year. Is the signal going to be before, uh, I guess, before dealership or by the train track? Because that to me is the, the issue. It's, it's the fact that it's impossible to turn to turn on. Like you know, you see these trucks. I mean, these you see these trucks like. like they, these guys put about to pull their hair out because they can't turn on to the street. Right. And so if there was a light sort of, I'm, I'm, you know, here's Industrial Drive, if the light was sort of before Industrial Drive yeah. and sort of made sort of a dead space, or just, or even a sign saying don't, you know, block, don't block the block. intersection. Well, you won't be able to with the new traffic light. Oh, yeah. awesome. That's well, far enough back, the traffic trail trucks need large turning races come into the industrial park. So with the knowledge corridor coming, which is the high-speed rail, we got the state to commit to redoing the signals between King Street and the industrial park so that all the timing sequencing will work with the high-speed rail coming through. So we're trying to advance the Damon Road project, which is a reconstruction, multi-million dollar project for redo Damon Road. But it was critical to get this segment done right away, and that's what we wrote through Mass, Do Mass DOT on getting that done. We're expecting construction is going to happen next year. So just so you aware of that. Which means that even more people are going to be coming down our road. <coughs> <coughs> I think there's actually less trucks going in front of my house. The other thing that, so that everyone here is aware of is that Mass DOT controls the interstate system and the vicinity of Damon Road where these Coca-Cola signs are. We work with them on the overhead warning system device. But that's really in their jurisdiction. Right. I'd be more happy to work with Mass DOT to try to correct it, but it's really in their jurisdiction, not the city's jurisdiction. So I go from Grant Street um, eastward towards Calvin Coolidge is not uh, It's in the vicinity Sheldon of, yeah, Sheldon Field vicinity is where the state layout begins. Actually, 20 minutes before the meeting, did a little tour of the signage um, on exit 19 ramp and through downtown. And I actually should give you guys, I was working with Julie in the record bureau, and I can give you a copy of this too, right? But um, they've added some streets for restricted uh, truck, tractor trailer traffic. And um, <laughs> I was documenting no truck signs on our Ward 3 residential streets. I was at Lincoln taking a picture. And there's actually a truck detour sign there that says they can use it. Right. But according to that report, they're not supposed to be on it. <laughs> and as I'm taking this photograph, well, there's a huge tractor trailer taking it right. Oh, interesting. On it's the a question of direction, too. Because if okay. you go up from Boy Street, that's, that's the official escape route. Right, it's, it's um, an escape route for trucks. If, if they make a mistake and they, they turn off base 19. But I think according, I think if according to that only? citation, three, oh, really? twelve. Oh, really? southeasterly only. Okay. So coming in, going in the northwesterly direction. They're okay to take a right? Yeah, yeah right now they are. Okay. They're all over there. Out of the industrial park. Actually a good thing. They can't do that, but they do it all. Because if they miss, if they're, if they miss, going straight onto Damon at, at exit 19 and they, you know, take that left and you say, <coughs> oh, geez, what do I do now? Then we can say, put more clear and <laughs> vision, seeable signage saying, yeah, take a right onto Lincoln. Well, so I'll, I'll lose Lincoln Avenue the next election. <laughs> <laughs> um, can't this all be solved? I mean, I, it seems like before we talk about high speed bumps, which is a, a huge cost, and it seems like all this can be solved by just a little bit, slightly more police tickets. I mean, write, write, a a couple, write a couple of tickets, write a couple of tickets for, write a couple more tickets for these big truckers. It stops, because that will pass off. You know, uh, it just seems like that's the cheapest way to do it. Now, I mean, I have no idea how it's Please, please time cost money. But that's been so generating as well. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the symbol of the problem for me is on Day Avenue. 
We talk about signs. There's a sign that just says no trucks. Particularly truck with it. <laughs> but it's always on the ground. <laughs> because the truck is not good. Um, <laughs> on purpose. Yeah, right. Just out of spite. So you get trucks on an up day road? Oh, not yet. Not yet. Trucks coming up day have all the time. Yeah. And they just, go just like the down it. Yeah. Yeah. And leave the. Yeah. From, they leave from the coal plant, go back around the turnaround, right. and leave on day. Don't you, have, don't you have parking on both sides on, on day? No. No. Mm -hmm. Just one side. And it's also in others that are narrow streets. It's more narrow. Than so our neighbor, um, we live on the corner of Coolidge and Bridge Street. Um, our neighbor, who lives on the other corner of Coolidge and Bridge Street, across from a quadro insurance, had been having, because sometimes trucks will accidentally make a turn onto Coolidge rather than onto Day or Lincoln. And, um, or there would sometimes there are deliveries to some of the, um, the uh, businesses in the back on Crosby. So they had been consistently being run over. Their property was being run over because the trucks were making, uh, couldn't make the turn. Well, there's a telephone pole right on the corner on of, our our side. of our side. So the trucks cannot come onto our property, so it goes on. The trucks would, would make a swing, a large swing, and turn onto our neighbor's property. So the corner of their property was constantly being um, uh, dug mm -hmm. out by these trucks. And uh, about two years ago, um, what they did was they put up two lar three, three large uh, pillars, concrete, uh, concrete pillars, Yes, that just, definitely. they don't look terrific, don't I mean, they don't look very direct decorative, but that stopped, that for a couple of weeks, or maybe a couple of months, a couple of the trucks who had gotten used to that, they um, couldn't make it through, they couldn't make the turn, and then they, then it stopped, um, it stopped the um, truck turning. So that's one way a private owner, if you have that kind of, I mean, but that, that effectively cut out the, a, the 18, Wheelers who were making that turn um, uh, might have pushed them to Sherman yeah, Avenue, yeah, but two, I don't know. Two, two things with the trucks on, you know, because they, again, we live on uh, Bridge Street and Coolidge Avenue, and I'd say at least once a week I, there's a truck that would stop right in front of our house because they're lost, or they're trying to figure out what to do next. And I've, I've watched trucks go very slowly down Bridge Street because they're looking for some way out. Because once, they, once you, you're committed to that left turn that's off it. of exit 19, that's it. So they will stop and, they, and there's a fear, at least once a week, right. one or two trucks. Also, I refer to Frank as a patron saying <laughs> exit 19. <laughs> all the work you've done on, on um, the design of it. And, um, so in, in the, not the near future, but a little farther than the near future, there is a roundabout planned. Yeah, and that will help. And that will help. Them. That will help the trucks coming off of exit 19 once the roundabout is put in place. Because then they can, they're not committed, so much committed to the left hand turn. Right. Exactly. Camus and Joel. There was some talk about having the truck turn around in the fairground somehow or on the other side of the street. Whatever right. happened with that. Right, sure. <coughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know how serious a proposal that was or, or how far it got. Um, I'd I say it's, it's worth keeping in the, in the mix as we explore options. Where did you try to turn around at uh, Market Holly Bridge? So, you know, you get to the, they freak out, they get to the bridge. It's an 11 foot clearance. Um, there's a tiny, I photographed it this afternoon, a tiny white sign in front of the roost saying truck detour to Holly, which they're supposed to take a left onto Holly, then a left onto Phillips, on the right and then right back onto um, Bridge Street. But it's a remarkably small sign. And the word I was struggling with before was visibility. So I think right. that. Uh, that's a real issue with the current signage. Right. Yeah, and trucks do uh, Phillips. Uh, get complaints on Phillips as well. Oh, um, you're right, that's another official statement. Yeah. yeah. Joel, you ready? So I just wanted to put in a plug for Northern Avenue. I know it's not okay. nice, but it's pretty torn up. Our curb stone is basically uh, surfaced. Okay. Um, so that's some of our neighbors here. So I'm kind of happy. Northern Avenue is well represented. <laughs> Um, 
on North Street. I'm certainly happy to be a pothole season this year. Um, I'm a little concerned at what's going on with the sidewalk. They seem to be starting to erode the yeah. surface. You can see gravel starting to poke away. Mm -hmm. It's not like pitch, but definitely the surface is coming mm -hmm. off, especially in front of driveways. And I was a bit surprised to see it happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There has been, in addition to that, and my hope is that it's, it's a seasonal phenomenon, that, that the, the cement sections in parts where there may be um, not quite as good a drainage under one particular length of sidewalk, the sidewalk is lifting from the heaving and the slightly, and it, and it, it pops up above the profile of the, of the, the curve. But recently, since it started to get a little warmer, I've noticed that some of those places have resubsided. So is that just something we should kind of live with? Or could there be some places along the way where, in fact, there may have been not quite as much of a solid drainage situation underneath the cement and, and try to fix the areas that are obviously a problem, whereas most of it seems to be fine? Or should we just live with the fact that it's going to do that in places and hopefully it will subside su sufficiently once it, it warms up? That's, that's part of the winter and also it's frost. Sure. 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 We went in there, grounded down during the winter, we had the opposite problem in the middle side during the summer and settled back down again. Yeah. 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 So what we try to do is pull these slides that are big enough and hopefully heavy enough that they won't be looking around. Is it a big deflection or is it a... But there were just some corners of the slabs that, that were trippers for a while, but I've noticed in places, we've gone back over them recently, that they have they, they've subsided somewhat now that it's gotten into warmer. I think it's one because we live around the city, there are other situations where we've noticed that for a bit this year. I think it has a lot to do with the, the severity of the winter and the water increase that we've had. How, how are the con, con street sidewalks? I don't know, okay. I know we had a water dip the other day, and the cross line was down a good three, three and a half feet. So it's a nice pushing down there. It was all winter. Yeah. One of the places with the sidewalk is particularly bad is Curtis. Yeah. It's it kind of a disconnect from the curbing. Yeah. yeah. And it's one of those that you know, hopefully everything just settles back in. Right. Right. I guess the, my question about that is since these are brand new sidewalks as of last fall, is there any recourse with the construction company that put them in where they may not have done a proper compaction before they started to I don't think there's any problem with, with the construction company. I think they did a fine job. I mean, you have to consider that you know, we put eight inches of compact gravel as a standard underneath the sidewalks for drainage. It really uh, doesn't make, you have to sort of draw a design limit and say you, know, you can't go down four feet and put gravel down right. so that there's clear drainage and take care of any uh, groundwater that might be happening in a localized, in a localized area. So I, I don't see any blame in the contract whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I think the same problems up at the state hospital two or three years after construction with the uh, <coughs> uh, new building that went on the corner of uh, Village Hill Road and, and Route 66. We had the same issues with the sidewalk heaving above and beyond the curb. Mm -hmm. And we had to actually reconstruct part of that sidewalk because it didn't settle in the spring. So something we monitor. Any other questions? Thoughts? No, I know. Go ahead. Well, I'm Jerry Budger. I live on 127 Bridge Street. And I just want to say that as far as the trucks go, there's a lot of them that are coming down Parson Street and getting hung up around the Bridge Street School on Union Street and turning around. And it's caused a lot of problems. I happen to notice since I live in Europe. But I want to make a suggestion about where to go from here. It's just a thought. There seems to be a number of different agencies involved and a number of different moving pieces to this. And maybe what would be helpful, Ryan, is Counselor and the Chair of the Parking and Traffic Commission to put together a small working group of DPW, police, residents, others, you know, traffic and parking, and sit down and try to work through this place. Rather than try to do it in a very big group, just have a group of people sit down and try to go through this with and then and the other folks from the police department because they're all they've all got a piece of this. Yep. So you might as well get everybody in the same room at the same time mm -hmm. trying to all deal with it. I, I, 
and it's a good, and it's one of the virtues of the transportation parking division. Is it does have the deputy represented the police department, uh, central services, um, and among others. So um, I think that's that's a, a good approach. Um, Can that DOT be brought? in on it too for, you know, I don't really know what's going on with the exit 19 and the possible release, but I mean, that was supposed to, a year ago, when they approved the plans, my understanding, and I, uh, I emailed the engineers maybe a couple of months ago, and it was supposed to take one year from December of 2012, which would have brought it up to around January 2013. 13, uh, no, 14, um, that the plans would be at 25 percent, and they are not at 25 percent as of yet, in my understanding. Okay. Is. So as soon as the plans are at 25 uh, percent, they're, they're supposed to have another meeting of the uh, Project Advisory Committee, and then bring it to a public hearing, to a public meeting. But so maybe there's just, time in the meantime to improve? Yeah, yeah. My sense is that when they looked at the new numbers for uh, uh, for the exit, that it is not a priority for them at this point in time. So that I think it's taken a little longer to come to 25 yeah, percent. Okay. So that's mm -hmm. well, we've gone to pretty much exactly one hour. Um, Matt, I don't know if you had something you were to say. No, I just want to say some of what I do. Um, they just completed the road safety audit, which is part of Mass DOT's um, program to get to a 25% review. And that was done back, um, I think it was in December. I haven't seen the findings of the report yet, but I'm sure they're going to be coming out anytime soon. And with that, I would assume that the 25% review would be sometime this year. Yeah, I was, I, I, was, I was expecting it like in January, but then I found out that it's it's, it's delayed. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm hoping that it will be sometime this year. What does that mean at 25%? Basically, that is when the first real public hearing takes place for Mass DOT for a project. It's 25% of what? Though? It's 25% designed. Okay. Uh, but basically, you have to have like, you really have to have a clear design. They don't like to see a lot of changes now at 25%. They want to make sure that all the right of ways are been taken care of, all the land takings, easements, those are shown up. So basically, the project is moving forward with very little uh, deviation. Mm -hmm. So that's the new standard that Mass Highway started uh, doing about four or five years ago. That's their standard. Yep. Used to go, you go up to up to 75% and you're still making major changes. Now it's all done at 25%. See, up to, up to, to uh, put the plans in place to generate the 25%. Um, what we worked on, we had conceptual plans, and uh, we had variations of maybe six, seven, or no, 12 different themes of conceptual plans. Now it down to one theme, they take that plan, and then they start engineering it really finite uh, details, and they bring that to 25%, and then that goes to a public hearing. And public hearing is a place where we could, we could bring up signage and those kind of smaller details. That would be appropriate. It would be appropriate there if you can um, get the information earlier to them. They might be more appropriate. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about where the design guidelines are for this moratorium period for larger projects? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so this is about zoning, um, and last week was moratorium on. Uh, the are of seven units or greater. And the planning board is looking at um, a series of guidelines for how those larger developments would would be built and the rules have to adhere to. Where it is now, to answer your question, is the planning board has been looking at drafts of, of, of these standards. They'll probably be voting on it on Thursday. And if it passes at the planning board, it will come to the city council early in April. We will refer it out for a public hearing. Um, and so there'll be a public hearing process where we can come in and weigh in about that aspect of zoning, the zoning changes, which is kind of the unfinished business of zoning from last year. And it's actually very important for, for Ward 3. And a lot of people from Ward 3 spoke out about that issue last year. Do you have any 
you feel in this process there'll be enough opportunity for public input that will meaningfully influence the final product? I hope so. I mean, about a month or so ago in this room, we had a forum about um, the property at Smith College owns uh, on Lyman Road in the Fort Hill area. And you know where this was at Smith um, uh, property is now. It's, it's probably the biggest piece of land you're going to find this close to downtown, and it's the most dense kind of zoned area. It's, it's URC. Um, so that I think it's very timely to talk about that right now in, in the context of the new zoning. So I'm hoping that we can have um, maybe even an additional public meeting about how the new zoning would impact the Lyman process, because that would be very instructive. I hope they answer your questions. Yes. <coughs> um, Ryan, just backtracking for a minute to Jerry's idea about a, work, a small working group, which I think is a terrific idea. Are you going to take the lead in reaching out to people to put that together? I might. Um, I, I, I'm just being honest, and, and I'm thinking it through right now as, as we speak. It might be that it's something that the Transportation and Parking Commission does as a commission. I mean, in a way, that is your sort of dream group that has all, like I said, all the relevant departments, rather than create ad, another ad hoc committee. Will Although, if we decided, when I'm it's sorry. Gonna come, will you let, for example, this particular group of people know yeah. when it's going to be discussed? Yep, yeah, I think it's something um, we could bring up at our, our next meeting, which is the third Tuesday of the month. So, in the middle of next month, uh, and I will let you know. And we can raise it for discussion. Great. I think that'll be a good form. Anything else? No, I'm surprised nothing was thrown at me. Oh, well, now here we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to say about the design <coughs> guidelines. It's really important for another piece of Ward 3 also. And I don't think I'm speaking out of course here, but um, there is an interested buyer for the Shaw's Motel property. Oh, okay. yeah. And they have not sign the papers yet, they're waiting to see what the design guidelines look like. Um, but if they're suitable, they will go ahead and make the purchase and do the, the, the project on the site. So um, I would hope that the people around uh, that area would also be notified, because yep. I think it's of great importance to them. No, you're right. That's another important test case. <coughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you can be the last one, and then we can yeah. break up and we can have individual comments. I just want to just make sure, because Jerry brought this up briefly, but to, to, um, to really let men, I appreciate you being here, but to, uh, and I don't expect you to give an immediate answer tonight, but just so you know that it's a real hot spot, is that trucks coming off of Bridge Street onto Parsons Street by Bridge Street School turn onto Parsons Street in an event, in an attempt to get back to the industrial park and they end up on the corner of Parsons and North where they cannot make the turn without causing property damage to either my neighbor, my neighbor across the street, or myself. And they end up blocking the street. The police have to show up. We spend 15 or 20 minutes trying to get a tractor trailer around that bend from Parsons Street onto North off toward the industrial park. And there's no signage at the end of Parsons Street where the Bridge Street uh, entr entrance is telling them not to turn that way. I would implore you for the DPW to talk to yourselves or your sign department and try to put a sign up there to get them to not do it. And if they do end up there, then they're breaking a law because there's no they're, they're ignoring the signage. And I would implore the police department to aggressively ticket those drivers. Mm -hmm. or maybe the word will get out there through their CB radios. Don't go that way. Right. Well, if they get a $300 ticket every time they make that bad turn, right. it's just it's just so damn frustrating. I mean, we've had cars parked on Parsons Street, and anybody that's on Par that's been on Parsons Street knows how narrow that street becomes as it gets down to the North Street end. You know, cars that are legally parked on Parsons Street losing their side view mirrors or having big scratches on the side of them that are obviously from trucks, you know. And I'll add one, one quick thing to that that's just something to think about in terms of the overall dynamic of how to deal with this issue is that turn at Big Street School is their last chance before they get into the exactly. center of town. Right. And when they get into the center of town, that's a whole other ballpark of intensity of fire and police uh, distraction and 
required presence in order to help the drivers extricate themselves from the ultimate <coughs> constriction, which is at the center of town, which then kind of, and that's the part where I've always been a little amazed that the that city hall itself, and I mentioned to David Narkowitz when when we were when we were pushing to get him elected, was please see if you can deal with the issue of the trucks ending up in the center of town, which a lot of them will, more of them that cannot turn on the side streets and come around back on north. If, we, if we're effective in keeping them from coming back on north, that many more are going to end up in the center of town. And then the question is, you know, how does the city deal with an increased number of trucks that now all the signage has effectively keeping them from going on to the side streets and back around. They're going to end up that many more in the center of town. And I, I asked him then, and I, I hope I have a chance to ask him again soon, is you know, can, the city, can the city hall be a part of that discussion about how to save taxpayers' dollars and effectiveness of major departments of not being distracted by the presence of lost trucks in the center of town? Oh, I haven't gone up, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, well, again, I want to thank everyone very much. Um, I'm here if you want to talk a little more.